You're listening to the Valley Labor Report with David Story and Jacob Morrison. As a as a Union Talk Radio show host, I'm all the time getting asked for kind of a historical context and Every time I'm asked for that, I always reference Hammer and Ho. Uh, and so the author of that work is Dr. Robin Kelly. So I thought, who better to talk to about this than him? So Dr. Kelly, thank you so much uh, for, uh, for being willing to talk to us tonight. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So Dr. Kelly, I think the first thing that, that would be, uh, that I, I'd be, I think the audience would want to know is, the Alabama, the Hammer and Ho is the history of the Alabama Communist Party during the Depression era. What made you interested in studying like such a ostensibly niche topic? What, what was it that the Alabama <laughs> Communist Party, of all things, uh, made you want to study them? That's a great question, because my, my dissertation advisor asked the qu same question. In fact, I think he used the term niche topic. Um, <laughs> And I think his joke was, was actually more of disparaging my project was, um, you know, you have to write a dissertation more than 50 pages. Um, my dissertation, right. by the way, was about 698 pages. And um, I, you know, my, my road to this project really was through the political work I was doing back um, in the 1980s. I mean, this, uh, my dissertation was written in 87. Uh, the book came out, um, revised version in 1990, so it's really 30 years. Uh, and it was a time when um, in, the, in the late 80s, when a lot of us were involved in, um, in left organizing. Uh, in my case, I was in Los Angeles, um, involved with the anti-apartheid movement. Uh, and I was actually writing about South Africa. My field was, was African history. And so I was looking at the left in South Africa and its history, and it dawned on me um, after I'd read this magnificent book uh, of Ho it's basically Hosea Hudson's life story put together by the great historian Nell Painter, uh, which is called, which is basically his his memoir, uh, oral memoir of Hosea Hudson. Hosea Hudson was a leading communist um, in Alabama at the time, and, and was still alive, living in, in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, and it was reading that book and reading about the Sharecroppers Union uh, that made me think, you know, the stuff I'm doing in South Africa sounds very similar. So my proposal at the time was to look at South Africa and the U.S. South and the left. Um, the South African government helped me decide to work in Alabama because in 1986, I wasn't getting into the country. <laughs> I'll never forget right. the day I went to the South African consulate, you know, with my visa application and they'd see me there protesting and the, the woman behind the glass was like, just laughing at me. Like, why would you even think about like applying to go there? So that took the South Africa part out of it temporarily. But what it did was it left me uh, with, um, with Alabama. And I was going to look at the whole South, but Alabama was really the heart of the party's work precisely because um, they were very strong in the Birmingham Bessemer area. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, they wanted to build uh, an industrial uh, unionized, uh, you know, kind of uh, class movement. And it's funny because they didn't think they would be as successful as they were in the rural areas. Um, places like Tallapoosa County, Montgomery County, you know, uh, Lowndes County. But instead, they knew Birmingham Bessemer area was the place. So I basically followed the documents. I went, did a lot of you know, research, talked to a lot of people, um, and put together this book. And again, the context is important because when I was writing it, um, it was on the verge of the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Soviet experiment, Eastern Bloc countries. It was at a moment um, when we had a decade of you know, Reaganism and Bushism, uh, which is really, uh, you know, Reagan begins uh, the decade with this first attack on um, the Air Traffic Controllers Union. I mean, it's just the anti-unionism, especially a, a, a union that actually endorsed Reagan, <laughs> uh, which is kind of an amazing thing. So this was a moment when many of us were doing this kind of work, um, trying to, you know, labor uh, with labor, 
And the Communist Party in Alabama just seemed like a great place to study the questions. And specifically, the question that I want to that I was posing was, how do you build uh, a multiracial radical movement that in, 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 a, in, in an area where the, the, the crux of the work class is mostly black and you have a bastion of white supremacy? Like, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. And the thing that, that um, I, I have to say I learned, which for a lot of people of my generation and after was pretty shocking, is how successful the party was. And not just the party, but all the other organizations that had uh, a relationship right. with, whether it's um, the union movement, international labor defense, um, uh, whether it's you know, looking at the sharecroppers union, that they really did do a great job. And the amazing thing is, despite being a kind of bastion of white supremacy, which I would say all of America is, um, you had some amazing white um, working class radicals who came out, risked their lives, lost their lives in some cases, uh, to fight on behalf of the class, of the working class. And that's, a, to me, a lesson that we have to continue to go back to always, because there's a sense of um, almost, uh, not, I wouldn't say complacency, but sort of dread that there's no possible way that you can build a multiracial movement again, that those days are, are over and they were never really that powerful anyway. But I think that the party, this, the story of Alabama is a story of not just resilience, but of militancy. And it's a reminder and something I've always argued that people are too quick to ride off the South. I mean, when um, I remember when, when um, uh, the last president was elected, and all my colleagues here at UCLA, you know, and, and people in LA were all like self-congratulatory about, oh, well, you know, California didn't go uh, for Trump. And, you know, we're so, we're so progressive, you know, though we have the, the largest prison population uh, in the country, but we're so progressive and we're, you know, the left coast and they wrote off the South. And I'm like, right. you don't understand that the South has always been the, the, the Achilles heel for American capitalism. I mean, you know, when you really look at it from reconstruction on down, this is where movements will take place. And sure enough, it's like the first place where Amazon is gonna finally have, you know, the co corporation is gonna have to deal with a union, a real union is gonna be in Alabama. Right, right. Yeah, well, that's, you know, you said a few things there that, that um uh, you know, the, the timing of, of the writing of your book, you, you started doing the writing and, and right after the fall of, of uh, right after the fall of the Soviet Union. I mean, that, you know, today writing this book would, would kind would, it would, uh, there's certainly a resurgence of, of kind of the anti-capitalist left. And so it wouldn't be, you know, somebody writing a history of the Alabama Communist Party right. today, like, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't really get, um, it, it, it wouldn't be that, that uh abnormal so to speak right. but right you know publishing it in, in <laughs> what was it the late 90s or early 2000s right. you know right. i i could imagine that you got a couple of a couple of looks about, right, <laughs> about right, right, that. Right. No, no, but it's, but, it's, it's not 1990 which is also strange i mean it came out in 1990 which okay is exactly which, which but you're right i mean you know you think about 89, 90, 91. This is mm -hmm. where you, th this is basically the fall of the Eastern Bloc, but you're right. It's also- The end of history. Yeah, the, the so-called end of history, exactly. Where to talk about um, communism was just like, people look at you funny, but to be, mm -hmm. but to be truthful. Um, and this is also the case in Birmingham in that period of time, because I have a lot of friends and comrades who were there in the late eighties. Believe it or not, there was a kind of resurgence of the left beginning in the early, beginning late seventies, early eighties, um, and it was after the Greensboro massacre, for example, uh, where five, well, four members of the Communist uh, Workers Party and then one uh, person who wasn't a member but was very close to the party was shot and killed um, by the Klan and by Nazis, and that didn't actually damper 
uh, it wasn't it didn't dampen rather the the left. It actually led to even more formation. So that for those of for those of us who were inside that world, if if I if I gave you the list of all the communist, Marxist, Leninist, Trotskyist, Marxist, Leninist, Maoist organizations that emerged, I'd be here all day. Right. There's so many. It just sort of took off. It wasn't a mass movement, but but just to say that inside those circles. Um, even if we saw the writing on the wall, even if we knew that the Soviet experiment, because none of us was really sort of supporting the Soviet experiment. It wasn't really, mm -hmm. it was no longer considered like a progressive move, but we did believe that socialism was still possible in right. the United States, you know, and that, well, that shaped it. That's interesting that that you noted the that there was a massacre that kind of kicked off um, a, a mini left resurgence during the time that you were writing this book. Because as I read the history in your book, a similar thing happened with the strength of the Alabama Communist Party, because uh, which is the Scottsboro Boys, right? Can you tell us a little bit about 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 that? And you know, I think. A lot of folks know some about the story of, of the Scottsboro Boys, but they don't know how the Communist Party was involved, which they were, you know, really the only ones kind of pushing it at the time. Some of the more mainstream liberal type organizations, the NAACP, they weren't really touching it. Talk to us about the Scottsboro Boys and how it played a similar role in sparking a, a real, um, you know, really sparking the movement for an anti-capitalist left in, in working class Alabama. Right. No, it's a great question. I have to give credit to Dan Carter because Dan Carter wrote the book on the Scottsboro case, um, an American tragedy. And, and, and in my reading as a graduate student, trying to figure out what to do, reading that book, which does deal with the communist party as well, uh, also inspired me. And he became a colleague of mine at Emory University. Um, so Scottsboro is interesting because what I do in the book is I look at it from the vantage point of Alabama organizers. We think of Scottsboro strictly as an international cause celebre, but basically the story is um, these nine young men, they didn't all know each other either, were, uh, you know, a lot of them were from Tennessee, riding the rails, trying to look for jobs. Um, and like everyone in those days, you know, just jumping in a, in a box car was a way to, to get around. Uh, so they happened to be there. Um, they end up getting in a fight with some white dudes. Uh, and, it, and then the cops stop in Paint Rock, Alabama, and um, they stop the train. When they hear about the complaint about the fight, they start arresting people and they discover two white women who are also riding rails, have no relationship to these men at all. But, and again, this is a very important lesson in terms of the kind of racial and sexual and gender politics that we, we dealt with then and we still do it today. Um, in order for these young women to try to get out of being arrested for solicitation, for whatever it is, just being mm -hmm. a, women alone <laughs> means that you're subject to police power. They said, well, these, you know, these guys raped, raped us, these nine mm -hmm. young, well, boys, some were boys, youngest right. was 13. Um, and some were like young teenagers, uh, older teenagers. So of course this never happened. Um, this, one of the um, uh, victims, I say victims, but one of the people who, who was accusers of Ruby Bates actually canted testimony. Mm -hmm. um, now, why did this happen? And this is where the Communist Party comes in. Cases like these were a dime a dozen where some black man or black men are being accused of a crime. If they're not lynched, the criminal justice system picks them up and they will be either legally lynched in the sense that they might get the death penalty or go to jail forever. Um, this happens all the time. Um, the Communist Party actually had something that a lot of progressive organizations didn't have, a newspaper, the Southern Worker. They had editors, they had organizers. They'd been fighting on behalf of black rights. Um, in Alabama, they were involved in a, a black girl who was, who was raped by a white man trying to get justice for her. Um, there were all these other cases. In fact, there's a whole, whole bunch of cases uh, in Alabama in 1930 involving a guy named Tom Robertson who um, was lynched because he had, a, uh, if I remember correctly, he had a fight over a, a, a car battery or some kind of battery. And the lynchings 
in Alabama and throughout the South led to a conference that was that the Communist Party held uh, in Tennessee, in Chattanooga, I believe. And in that conference, they said, look, we need to pay attention to lynching. We need to, to make this one of our agenda items. That's the context in which the Scottsboro uh, defendants are arrested and they become a case. So the party then jumped on it. The NAACP sent their attorneys, but they're not that interested. The party sent an attorney to defend these people. But what they did was they developed a strategy which they'd already developed before through the International Labor Defense. And that's a strategy of putting um, uh, injustice before the court of popular opinion. So the idea was to tell the world the story of the Scottsboro case, to get petitions everywhere, to show photographs, to get stories in the press in every single country. And so they, be, they took a local story and made it an international one to the point where you had demonstrations in Tokyo uh, free right. the Scottsboro boys, demonstrations in Moscow, demonstrations in Cape Town, South Africa. And that tragedy and their fight to try to free them became a mobilizing tool, or not, I shouldn't say tool, because that makes it seem like mm -hmm. it's deliberate, but it became a point of mobilization for African-Americans who had no interest necessarily in the left, but saw an organization fighting on behalf of the rights of black people within a criminal justice system that they knew was unjust in the first place. And that really changed the character of what the party was doing. And a lot of people joined because of that. It's, and it's a very similar story. It's like, you know, with Emmett Till, mm -hmm. Emmett, the, 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 the murder of Emmett Till did more to convince a lot of uh, black people to join uh, the civil rights movement, later SNCC, SCLC, then say Brown versus Board of Education, because Emmett Till was like, I, they could see themselves. Right. Just like a lot of African-Americans could see themselves suddenly caught up in some kind of dragnet and being accused of something they didn't do. And, you know, and, you know the, it was a tragedy in terms of how many people end up staying in jail longer than they needed to, um, which is one day more. Uh, but the fact is that for the Communist Party and for the left generally, for the CP left, um, the Scottsboro case became that, uh, that sort of rallying cry to build a movement that was not just about class struggle in the formal sense, but about racial justice. Right. And that my understanding of the way the way that you presented is that that and cases like that really did a lot to convince working class uh, black folks in Alabama that like the left is is kind of where I'm going to. Uh, get help to make my life better. And, and that's, if you could talk a little bit about kind of the makeup of the party, because I think that's one of the more, in, one of the most interesting things about the Alabama communist party is that, you know, when you think of communists um, in the 20th century in America, you might imagine kind of somebody like me, like a yuppie, like, you know, like some, <laughs> some, some white college educated yuppie. Uh, but that was not at all the party in Alabama. So what, you know, what, what, what was up with that? Right. No, it's a very, very good point. Um, this was a working class, mostly black organization. And by working class, and let's just focus, let's just focus on sort of the two regions. One is the kind of Birmingham Bessemer region and then the rural areas of Montgomery. But Birmingham Bessemer, you're talking about steel workers, iron ore uh, workers, um, miners. Um, uh, hold on one second. Um, can, can you close the door, please? I can't hear. Sorry about that. <laughs> I can, problem with pandemics, you have to like do the things from home. <laughs> no worries, no worries at all. Okay, so, um, so imagine working class, many of the folks, uh, not all, but couldn't read or write or had like maybe second or third grade education. Um, they um, were members of gospel quartets, many were mm -hmm. devout Christians. Um, the Bible became a very important source for them uh, in terms of uh, of kind of justifying the work that they're doing, explaining. Um, there was also, so you have this, white, this black working class kind of uh, base. Um, and in fact, at one point, the Communist Party's membership was larger than NAACP in Birmingham. 
like much larger. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so it was, I wouldn't call it a mass organization, but it did have significant numbers. Um, so there's that, but then also you have white working class men and women as well, as well as a couple of outliers. I mean, there was a woman named Jane Speed who, uh, who came from money and her mother also uh, came, they were very wealthy. Uh, they, the family happened to be in uh, Vienna, I think, under fascism and saw a lot. I mean, during, during and then end up coming back uh, to Alabama and then joining the Communist Party. And so she opened up a bookstore in Birmingham, a, a, a left-wing bookstore in Birmingham, Alabama in like 1939. I mean, who does that, right? Right. <laughs> no. um, and so it's an interesting group. And because it was predominantly black with, with white members, there was a way in which um, African-Americans were pushed into leadership positions within the party. So mm -hmm. imagine what it meant to be in a space where uh, black working class uh, men and women, often with very little edu formal education, could actually critique a white comrade who, who you typically can't even be in the same classroom with because of segregation, critique them and say, you know what, your positions are wrong and this is what we need to do. I mean, it was the kind of thing where the, the, the social relationships were just unheard of at the time. And it angered a lot of the white work class men and women, but they stuck with it, many of them did. Mm. And, and learn and develop social relationships that I would argue were stronger and more genuine than even some of the left uh, formations in places like Chicago, in LA, in New York, and Philadelphia. Mm. You know? Yeah, I, I think that that's really interesting. And, and you, you touched a little bit on the religiosity of these communities. How, and that's, that's uh, uh, you know, there, there are so many kind of narratives that, are, that, that your book really attacks kind of head on. And, and, and another one of them is that, uh, you know, communism is uh, anti-Christian and anti-religion. And certainly there are, there are, uh, you know, flavors of it that are, and Marx was not a theist uh, right. and he did not believe that people should be, but uh, basically everybody <laughs> in the party in Alabama was, what, what was right. that kind of interplay there between the, you know, I want, you said that the, they would use, um, that they would use churches for party meetings. Right, exactly. Party meetings and union meetings, some churches, because of course there were churches in sort of in the payroll of the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company, some ministers who got money basically to be union busters, uh, which goes to show you there's a long history of uh, black elite complicity in undermining working class movements. But for the most part, um, the, the, the gospel quartets for some black male members like, uh, I think it was Henry O. Mayfield and Jose Hudson, that was a circuit of, of singers that was a recruiting tool for the Communist Party. No one ever think that, right? Wow. Um, but That's, the, I've always wanted to be in a gospel quartet, <laughs> right, so maybe, <laughs> maybe this is the way in. <laughs> I know, it's, it's, it, sh it shocked me, but you know, Jose, I spent a lot of time with Jose Hudson telling me these stories. But also, um, the Bible became very important because and, you know, it was a genuine use of the Bible and understanding of it, mm -hmm. what we would think of today as liberation theology, but they weren't thinking in those terms. Right. Um, because the Bible was the text that people knew. And, you know, and it was so much in, the, in their biblical interpretation that justified the work they were doing um, mm -hmm. about the least of these, you know, and what does it mean to, to be uh, impoverished and it's a sin to have money and just basically hold on to it. So this is the kind of stuff that, that drew people to the party without it necessarily becoming a trick. You know, they weren't right. trying to convince people. But the other part of, of the story too is that um, among the, the white, uh, I wouldn't say elite, but the more educated members of the party were committed, especially during the popular front, many were Jewish. And many were in fact, um, uh, dealing with a Jewish community that, in some cases, was split, very anti-communist uh, on the one hand, but also very sympathetic, uh, depending, you know, because Alabama has a long uh, history of a Jewish community there. Um, and so that was also a, 
a, an issue or a factor in terms of who became the central uh, figures. People like Joseph Gelders, for example, mm -hmm. and his, his daughter Marge Gelders were among those. Um, and so, you know, this is not to say that there wasn't an interest in, in kind of Marxism or an interest in understanding the rest of the world beyond a kind of biblical framework. In fact, um, there was political education that took place. Um, the, I remember uh, one of the things that you said in the book was that uh, when I think it was Hosea Hudson was sent to New York to for that for that political education for those classes by the party that he came back and and something like he had never felt more right. kind of dignified more like a man and that, and that's that's really amazing and and you know uh, that's awesome. Yeah, well, what's great, I mean, he went to New York, but he also went to the Soviet Union. <laughs> right, right. Which is the other thing. So he went, uh, Henry O. Mayfield uh, went, uh, and they, they studied at um, a school, basically the Lenin School. Then there's also another school called uh, the University of Toilers of the East, Kupa. So imagine, just think about what it means to grow up in Georgia or Alabama, mm. or to be like Al Murphy, for example, is another one, who they know the South, they know churches, they know unions, um, they have spent some time in grade school, usually a, a segregated schoolhouse where they would only be in school for maybe a few months out of the year because they'd be kids of sharecroppers. Um, and then suddenly free passage right. to the USSR <laughs> to go to Moscow. Right. <laughs> and you've never been outside. I mean, some of those cats have never been outside the state of Alabama. So that was something that was extraordinary. And what's interesting is that some of them went there without basic literacy skills. So mm. it, was, it wasn't like they were studying, you know, Lenin and Marx's selected works. They were just learning to read and write and in circles with people from all over the globe from different levels of political education. And they did come back um, really emboldened, uh, emboldened in terms of their ability to organize, in terms of knowledge of the world. Uh, and then also the other source of education was the fact that there's a press. There's, so the Southern Worker mm. was published, uh, sharecroppers and, and, or, and workers would write letters to the Southern Worker, which would be published. They read the Daily Worker. They read the Labor Defender, which was the International Labor Defense uh, Journal. Uh, they read The Negro Worker, which was an international publication that circulated among some of the Alabama comrades that told stories about struggles in South Africa and Kenya uh, and in, in Australia, places like that. Um, I mean, it was an amazing uh, thing. And so what I do talk about in the book is that a lot of the uh, women, young girls in particular, were the ones who usually had more formal education and they mm -hmm. tend to be literate in part because the, the avenues of, say, working in a steel mill wasn't open to them. So for girls, black girls growing up in Alabama, um, they call it the farmer's daughter effect. You had to uh, get as much education as possible to be a teacher or a social worker. Mm. So they would be reading out loud to whole groups of working people under a shady tree or in a park, just reading from pages of the Southern Worker. And that's how people who couldn't read got the information. So imagine what it meant. It meant that, and this is one of my favorite stories, that in, when, when Ernst Hellman, who was a German communist, uh, was thrown in prison under Hitler, and this is before the real takeoff of um, um, the Third Reich, uh, there was a whole campaign to free him. So you have these uh, African-Americans never left Alabama young people putting out posters and leaflets uh, throughout Tallapoosa County saying, free, free Ernst Tailman. And the owners of the plantation are like, who? Who is this? What are you doing? And so when they say that there was a conspiracy and there were reds, I mean, mm. it's kind of true. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they just happen to be black. Right. You know? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the whenever during the civil rights movement, you know, one of the things uh, uh, that that you'll see from some of the white reactionaries is like race mixing is communism, and it's like, well, I mean, you know, there's <laughs> there's <laughs> some truth to that. Yeah, I mean, you're not completely wrong. But, no, I but, drink yeah, 
Yes. Guys, uh, we got a couple of questions coming in. Yeah, we've got a okay. couple of questions. I've okay. I've seen the I, I've seen the YouTube chat and I'm I, I'm working okay. on incorporating them in as okay. uh, so I, yeah, I've got those in my head, David. Okay. I appreciate it. Um, but yeah, the uh, you you said that um you know, there's a lot of this international cooperation in the party uh, on the part of these folks who, uh, that, you know, a phrase that I, I use is I ain't never been nowhere. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm just some, you know, uh, guy who grew up in rural Alabama, I ain't never been nowhere. And these, these folks have they ain't never been nowhere. And now they're going internationally and learning all of these things. And there's a lot They're They're talking about free freeing German communists mm -hmm. from, you know, Nazi oppression kind of stuff. But th there is also a lot of really interesting autonomy uh, that, right. that the Alabama Communist Party had that that I, I'd like for you to talk about some because the uh, you know, there were a lot of international uh, drama. So does I mean, you know, I mean, it's more more important than that but uh, there was a lot of international conflicts within the international communist right. movement that the alabama communists were like you know whatever we'll take the party line but it doesn't really matter to us they were really kind of singularly focused on or i mean not singularly but they were really focused on how do i make my life better right right that is absolutely true because you cannot peg the different machinations of the Communist International to what was happening on the ground. So to just give you three quick examples, one, um, the Communist Party's position in 1928 was that uh, Black people in the Black Belt uh, counties of the South have a right to self-determination, a right to succeed from the Union if they choose to and have their own nation. Well, I mean, it was an empowering idea, but it wasn't like folks who were trying to figure out how to not be be evicted from their house or who needed coal um, because they hadn't, you know, they had burned all the firewood they had just to keep warm. They weren't thinking about that. They were thinking about what to do next. And so they developed all these strategies that were so local, like using penny postcards to send to social workers to say, you know, if you take the workers flour and stuff, um, we're, we're after you. We're going to expose you. In fact, we know that you're sleeping with the principal of the school, and we're going to expose that information. That's the, that's the strategy. Um, strategies also involve things like being really underground, using jumper cables to get people's lights back on without being detected. But in terms of I the liked that one. That was really yeah, like, <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, in 19, there was one change. Well, another change I should mention is that when they had the Nazi-Soviet pact uh, and... The, um, the Communist Party went from being like strongly, you know, anti-fascist to then focusing on uh, supporting the Soviets' agreement with the Nazis in 1939, which was a bad decision, but was, was meant to be a kind of stopgap measure to try to keep the um, Germans from invading Russia. Whatever the case may be in terms of how one reads it, the fact that it matters, that didn't matter to people on the ground. That wasn't right. their fight. Um, and, but the one place where it did matter internationally was in 1935 when the Communist International decided um, they're going to uh, you know, open up the Popular Front idea so that they could build alliances with liberals. And this is where in, in Alabama, it was a little bit different in that um, the, the party leadership did try hard to do just that, to build alliances with white liberals in the South, often at the expense of the working class struggles, the expense, not so much the expense of the union, because they were kind of going kind of underground participating in the union, but really at the expense of the unemployed, expense of, of all those kind of grassroots struggles. And the idea was, if we can just get a broader base, that we'll be stronger. But the problem is that in a place like Alabama, like Georgia, like Louisiana, Mississippi, to be a liberal um, in the South, to be a white liberal, was to be less radical <laughs> than some of the white working class comrades. Um, liberals were, were devoted to Jim Crow, were committed to the status quo. Uh, liberals were like Hugo Black, who was uh, you know, a Supreme Court justice, but also started out in the Klan. That's what mm -hmm. liberals look like. So what they end up doing is, is cutting some of their ties and undermining 
the, the sort of working class foundation that they had uh, in, in trying to chase down liberals that they could never win. And instead of what they did, they, they did get were um, really amazing radical intellectuals like Joseph Gelders, um, you know, like, and like people, I should, I could say this now, uh, like, um, uh, like Rosa Parks, you know, who mm, wasn't a member right. of the party, but she was very close to those folks. Um, Sally Davis, who's uh, the mother of Angela Davis. I mean, there's a, a lot of interesting people who are close to the party, if not members. Right, right. That's and and so you know there was a there was a lot of focus on kind of um, what can make my life better, what what's happening on the ground, and how can we use the party to, um, you know, make our lives better. And and so what were and, and one of those ways that they saw was the labor movement. And I think this will, this will be a good, good way to bring us into what's happening today, but what were the Alabama communist party's um, connections to the labor movement and how did they, how did they use the the labor movement for uh, kind of for their own ends and how did they uh, work with the labor movement? You know, what, what was the the intersection there of, of the labor movement and the party in Alabama? Right. Well, to answer the question, how did they use the movement for their own ends? Their ends were um, simple, to build a strong labor movement. <laughs> right. And so that's, that's really, I mean, that's just something, to, a point of clarity for, for your listeners, because. Yeah, I um, appreciate that. That was not, yeah. that was not good wording on my part. No, 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 but, but no, but it's, it's exactly, I'm glad you said it that way, because actually that's, that is, that is how we think often of it. And I think it's important to frame it that way because, because it is true that what they want to do is build a strong labor movement because their argument was, we need a strong labor movement because that's how you build a strong working class movement. And so the party, so you got to think of it as sort of three different phrase, phases. The first is before the CIO where the party was uh, the, the main force in town. It, in 1934, Alabama experienced a massive uh, strike wave. Textile workers, um, steel workers, miners, and the Communist Party was behind, not so much the textile workers, but the other strikes. They really were building uh, a movement and they had these alternative unions, um, maritime workers in, in Mobile. Um, and so they were building a union movement and then, the, then with the New Deal, uh, and with the second New Deal, um, the opportunity for industrial organizing, you know, this is first New Deal is like the National Industrial Recovery Act, but then uh, with the Wagner Act, there was like a, a, a catalyst for really building industrial unions. And that's where the CIO comes into play. And so here, the role of the party was not so much to be open, because this so coincides with the popular front, but, but to go as individual uh, activists as individual organizers into the unions, and they were the best organizers. Eb right. Cox, I mean, Eb Cox and Henry O. Mayfield and, and, and Jose Hudson, uh, Asbury Howard, which who wasn't a communist, but very close to the party, was the leader of the International Union of Mine Mills and Multi Workers, along with, Reed, with, with Van Jones um, and a bunch of other folks who were like either in or close to the party. Mm. And so they built the CIO, but more importantly, and this is very, very important, they pushed for an agenda in which unions were also fighting in communities for voting rights. Mm. So the Right to Vote Club was a union, uh, had a union connection. Communists mm. were organizing Right to Vote Clubs and were pushing CIO members, Black members in control politics to, to have that right preserved. And all the sort of third period you get is because the book technically is about the depression, but it has a long chapter that goes into the forties and fifties and into mm -hmm. the, the present. And in that chapter, I talk about um, the left led unions and how the cold war and red baiting and, and anti-communism really were intended as a, as a, a, a weapon to undermine in particular the international union of mine mill smelter workers, which is strong investment. Um, and in that union, its leader, Asbury Howard, uh, was really a kind of civil rights union, working class, brilliant organizer 
who then was attacked on all sides uh, through the anti-communist work. In 1949, the CIO, which by that time was really run by anti-communists, um, forced all the left unions to either sign a loyalty oath and do all kinds of things or be expelled. In mine, mm-hmm. Noah was expelled in 1949. Right. Yeah. You said that, you know, these organizers were really good and the unions were, were really effective. What were some of the, what were some of the things that they actually, that they actually won for their members? Um, well, you know, in the best examples tend to be the rural areas, but just in terms of the urban and, um, you know, the most important thing that they were able to do through steel workers organizing committee, SWAC, uh, and through mine mill, and the United Mine uh, Workers, um, those three big unions, um, party organizers, party members, were the ones that were able to recruit and win over um, uh, uh, workers. And, and, those, and that's how the unions were able to survive. And they built the CIO in many ways. But they also fought um, company unions. And this mm. is something we don't always talk about. I mean, we'll get to this with respect to the Amazon workers, but one of the ways that, um, what, see, just your viewers may or may not know this history, but in those days, because of an, a strong National Labor Relations Board and because of the Wagner Act, which made all this possible, um, the, the, the NLRB was actually friendly to unions, which is not the, <laughs> that's not been the case for right. a while, but actually supported unions, supported the idea of unions. And so when Tennessee Coal and Iron Company, for example, would fire 160 workers for going on strike, um, the NLRB would say, go back to Tennessee uh, Coal and Iron and said, you know, you can't do that. That's illegal. You've got to reinstate them. So one of the things that happens in, in Alabama throughout the South and throughout the country is that in order to get around, in order to continue union breaking and to get around the new labor law, you create a company union. The company mm-hmm. unions are not new, but but these company unions are specific to this moment. So um, Uber's trying to make some right now. Yes, they are. They are. And and that's one of the questions about what's going to happen to Amazon. But um, to give you one one precise example, the Brotherhood of Captive Miners was a mm-hmm. union, it was a company union that was created uh, in response to mine mill. And what those communist organizers were able to do was succeed in both um, forcing union recognition and recruiting members from the Brotherhood of Captive Miners into Mine Mill. Right. Um, so they were really good organizers in that respect. They would, you know, and to be an organizer in a union often doesn't mean doing anything necessarily heroic but really being able to mobilize people and get them to stick with it and to win those elections. And that's what they were able to do, get them to win those elections um, by basically letting people know through uh, education work what the union is is there for. Right. 